Okay, so how is everyone today? Good. Tired. Tired. I'm just going to be honest. Yeah. Okay, so there's an exam in five days and five hours. Don't remind us. Something like that, yeah. So on Monday at 7 p.m., 7 p.m. to 8.15 p.m., there's an exam. Okay, uh, I sent a message this morning about how that'll go. And so let me just briefly summarize that message, and then if you all have any questions, let me know. So um, there will be a grade, not yet, but there will be a grade in the gradebook that says which room you're supposed to go to. The room's going to be conducted, uh, sorry, the exam's going to be conducted in three rooms, and all of the college algebra sections will be taking them simultaneously. So you need to look carefully in the gradebook at what your room is, because just because your classmate is going to that room doesn't mean that you need to be going to that room. Uh, <clears throat> so the exam, the midterm exam, is over the first five quizzes. Uh, on, the first, on each quiz there were two graded exercises. That means that there's been ten graded quiz exercises to now. At the midterm you, you will be given the opportunity to redo up to six uh, exercises, which means you could redo zero, one, two, three, four, five, or six exercises. Okay, so what that means is that you need to look at the look at the grade book and look at the grades let's write that was today the 10th no is it is it the 11th you need to look at the grades that have a name like quiz underscore zero four underscore zero one which would mean quiz four question one <clears throat> and uh, when, you, when you sort the, the, the grades by the course order, these are near the bottom, so have a look at those. And then what you should do is consider it to be like a wish list, like which six of these would be in my best interest to modify? Okay, then those should be the six that you should select at the midterm. Okay, so you should, you should have a look at <clears throat> those quiz exercises and make sure that you're familiar with how uh, to solve them. And probably not just those six, maybe you should prepare like eight. Because it may be the case that you think, oh, it would be really great if I could repair what damage I did on quiz one, question four. And then you have a look at the redo exercise and you realize, no, nope, that ain't happening. Because it could happen. Then you need to have an alternate to say, well, okay, I'm not gonna try now that I've seen what, it would, what I would need to do to fix quiz four question one, I don't think I can, so I'm going to use my alternate. Okay? So I suggest you prepare like at least eight. So any questions about the midterm? There's no mandatory questions. That's what the vote was. <clears throat> yes? Is the at, the, at the exam? No. If, if, if you don't attend the exam, then, well, you can't take any questions. You can't do any redos. So conceivably, you could, if you think, no, I just like I like all my quiz grades exactly the way they are. Okay, you don't have to come to the exam. Other questions? Yes. Then you have to stay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, because because the thing is, okay, is that we're not going to let people come in. Uh, late, uh, if if folks have already left. Yeah. Yes. But, sorry, I can't For thirty minutes. <laughs> Is it that that's that's she she's not pleased with that policy. Well, I mean, I it, it most injures the folks that have a, that want to fix exactly one. Okay, I get it. That's annoying. Uh, but. The thing is, is that once people leave, I'm not going to let new people in, okay? Because they could conceivably be transmitting information to their colleagues, okay? And that that would make that would change the conditions of the exam for some students, and that would not be uh, fair. So, any questions about any of that? So, yes, I mean. <laughs> You could come into the exam and say, well, I'm just going to fix one, and then look at that one and say, it's not happening. Well, 
then you have to stay for 30 minutes, okay? Just take a nap. <laughs> what, a, what a statement about our, about our society, 30 minutes is a big deal, right? Wow. <clears throat> okay. Any questions, uh, other questions? Before we get to new things. Is that, that's not the way it usually is. Yeah, I guess it is. Okay. Well, this thing, that thing's usually lower. That's what the, so now I can only get to right yeah. there. Okay. Yeah, that'll be all right. Okay. <clears throat> so, last time we were talking about, uh, yes? The exam? Uh, well, so a, l a little later, probably, maybe today, if not today, then tomorrow, I'll post where you're supposed to go. Uh, and it'll be, there'll be a grade in the grade book, a grade in the grade book that has the room you're supposed to be in. And it'll be on campus, <laughs> for sure. I think one of them is, one of the rooms is in the green building, or maybe two of them, and then another one is in the computer science building. Okay, <clears throat> so we were talking about extrema, specifically local uh, mins and local maxes. So to remind you, uh, to remind you of what those were, uh, something like I'll get that later. Uh, one function f has a local min at C if there is an interval A less than C less than B such that f evaluated at c is less or equal to f evaluated at x for all x in the interval a to b. Okay, so this is like a standard math definition that kind of makes you think you need to talk to a lawyer after you read it. <laughs> Not sure about that. Uh, well, what it's, what it's saying is that if we have a function <coughs> like this say so does this function have any uh, any local mins <coughs> and the answer is it does it does so local mins, conceptually, I mean, this is the exact definition, but the conceptual definition is, well, imagine that water was raining, that, that, that it was raining down. Where, is there any place that water would collect? Yeah. yeah, in those two places. Those are the local minima. So this point right here, this point right here, this C, is a local min because... Notice that it's not, it's not the lowest point on the whole plot because there's other points that are lower than it. For example, that point right there is lower. But we can cut out C within an interval. Say, for example, this interval. This would be A and that B. We can cut it out and then just look at this much of the plot. And if you just look at the, the plot that's in the box, then that C is the lowest point that's in the box. So it's like we cut out a little, a little bit of the plot. Similarly, uh, this is a local min because we could say, well, there's the lowest point, and then we can cut out, uh, cut out a bit, uh, etc. Okay. So how about... How about, uh, say, this one? So 
So does this plot have any local minima? It does, right? At that place where water would collect. Water would collect right there. But I have a different question. <clears throat> what about this point? Is that point a local min? I mean, it's the lowest point on the plot. Does that mean it's a local min? And the answer is no. No, it, this is not a local min. Now, on the one hand, you can kind of look at it like, well, would water collect there? <laughs> no, right? It would just sort of run off the side, I guess. Uh, but the, the definitional reason why it's not a local uh, min is because, well, can you cut uh, can you cut this point and put it in, and put it inside of an interval? And the answer is no, because there's no plot over here on the right. So there's nothing uh, because there's no plot on the right. This can't possibly be a local min, okay? Because there's nothing on the right. And similarly, uh, this point right here could not be a local max because there's nothing on its left. Okay, and this is not a local max, and that's not a local max. Okay, good. Any question about this? So local max is similar. You could just take this entire page and just turn it upside down, and now it's a statement about local maxes. Okay, good. <coughs> so I'll just write that that local max is similar, because we, we also discussed it a little bit last time. Okay. But those, the, this point, even though it's not a local min, it is still interesting in the sense that it is the lowest point attainable on the plot. So we need a different concept to talk about that. And that concept is global extrema. So in particular, F has a global, global min at C when uh, F of C is less or equal to F of X for all X in F's domain. So it kind of reads a, a little bit like a local max, but what's the distinction? Right. So for a local max, there has to be an, in, an interval has to exist. And C has to be in this interval. Okay, but for a global max, we're, we're not talking about uh, such an interval. <clears throat> so, for example, okay, so then. <clears throat> This point right here, uh, that's one of the previous kind. This is a local min. It's a local min. Is it a global min? It is not a global min because there's other points on the plot which are lower. So where is the lowest point uh, attained? Right, that one right there. So that right there is the global min. And then I could turn it upside down and it would be a global max. Okay. <clears throat> uh, 
How about this one? Does this one have a global min? So does it? And the answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. This is the global min. So now, this point is not a local min. Why is that point not a local min? Because there's nothing on its right. So it couldn't possibly be a local extrema, extremum. Uh, but it is a global extremum. It's a global min. That's the lowest point attainable on the plot. Notice that this global min is, is global but not local. And similarly, this global min is global and also local. Yes? Yes, and I'm about, I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> so, how about, how about uh, this one? So let's consider this plot. So does this plot have a global min? Okay, remember, the min, the, the global min, you, you're at some point on the on on the inputs. Okay, so let me ask: Is this the glo is this the global min? Right there. Why not? Why is that not the global min? Okay, C to pair maybe I could put some words in your mouth and say, well, that input produces that output, and I can see that there's other outputs that are less than it. So that couldn't possibly be the min, the global min. Okay, so does this function have a global min? So you're saying that it, so in the first place, could this be the global min? That couldn't be the global min. It couldn't be the global min. That, that point could not be the global min because it is not in the first place a point. In the same way that I could say, look at this lovely green apple that I have. And then you, then you, then you might object, that's not a green apple. And then I say, it's clearly green. <laughs> right? And then the, the problem is, is that it's not in the first place an apple. So is this, is this the point of global minimization? No, because it's not in the first place a point. So it couldn't be that one. So you're saying, ah, oh, we should just move a little bit to the left. Yeah. Okay. Well, suppose I move this far to the left. Is that the global min? No, no because I moved some to the left. And if I were to just have moved half that far, then I'd be, be at an even lower point. But that's true of any point that you suggest. If you say, well, just move a little bit, I say, well, why couldn't I move half that much? That such a point would be even less. So the answer is that this plot has no global min. There is none. <clears throat> so it's in 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 the study of quantitative things, science and math and things like that, it's exceptionally important to know whether or not the thing that you seek exists. Because if it doesn't exist, you shouldn't expend any effort trying to find it, right? <laughs> and it's, it can be quite important to know that, oh, I, that this thing that you request doesn't exist. Okay. Uh, global max is similar. Now, <clears throat> the, de the development of math is a, is a is a process that's going on through history, right? So, so math itself, like as a discipline un, unto itself, is only a few hundred years old, because there was a time just a little bit beyond that where where math it wasn't called math. Like uh, back in Newton's day, he was he his his name was a natural philosopher. That's someone who did science and 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 math and everything. So it, it wasn't even really its own thing. It, so, so it's a, 
math is, and all things are ongoing historical phenomena. And another thing that is an ongoing historical phenomenon is that, say, all spoken languages, for example, English. And <clears throat> the case in English is that, um, is that a lot of the vocabulary that's used by common folks is vocabulary that's taken from, eventually, uh, German-speaking languages. Uh, whereas, you know, fancier words, uh, those are typically taken from Latin languages, usually by way of French. So there's oftentimes there's there's more than one word for any given uh, uh, phrase or, or any, any given noun and verb and thing like that. So an example would be, you know, I could call these my glasses. Yeah, that's what common folks would say. But I, you know, I could be fancy and hold my pinky up when I say it and say, these are my spectacles, you know, <laughs> or, or something like that, right? And that's just, the, that's just the heritage of English as a language. So what I'm telling you is that math has a similar heritage with regard to extrema. And the names that, were, that I've written down on the page are local and global. So those two words go together. But you can use a different pair of words, and there's, there's nothing better or worse about them. They are called relative and absolute. So that is to say, we talked about local men and global men, but you could just as well talk about relative men and absolute men. <laughs> These are a pair, these are a pair. But these are synonyms. Synonym, synonym. And for reasons that I just cannot fathom, other than the author of this textbook just wasn't thinking clearly, didn't have a good editor, the, <laughs> the author of this textbook chose local and absolute. <laughs> reasons that are just not clear to me. <laughs> so, uh, okay. <laughs> I guess <laughs> that's what he, that's what the author did. Okay, but I'm going to use I'm going to use these for no good reason other than I'm going to just stick with this pair of the, rather than the other one. So, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, so let's have <clears throat> an example. <coughs> And incidentally, it's, 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 if you're into that kind of thing, it's an enjoyable topic to try and go through a whole, a whole long list of words and see what is its origination. In English, there's a great deal of Germanic words, a great deal of uh, words that eventually come from Latin, and then, it, and then words that come from Greek and words that come from Arabic. That's the majority of them. But there's others. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so how about... <clears throat> I'm going to draw some dots. In there. So, several questions. First question. Find all of the open intervals intervals where the function is decreasing.
Okay, so what do you think? Sorry? So where is it decreasing? From input, negative 2, all the way to 1. Okay. Now I'm asking for the open intervals, so the answer is negative 2 to 1. Oops, to 1. And then usually at this point some student says, well, why the open intervals? Why couldn't I write closed negative 2 to 1? To which I respond because I specifically asked for the open ones. And then, and then well, why did you ask for the open ones? <laughs> ah, at this point, I can't really tell you the a good reason why I'm asking for the open ones. But I can promise you that for reasons mathematical, I'm asking for the open ones, and, and I more or less have to. Uh, because, and it's basically that if I ask any other kind of question, then we get into technical diffic difficulties that I'm just, uh, I'm just shepherding us away from. Okay, so I'm keeping us in a nice, safe place uh, where, where I'm avoiding them. Uh, that being said, if you just really want to know the reason, uh, I, I'm going to insist on asking only for open intervals. Feel free to ask me after class. <coughs> Similarly, uh, I want the open intervals uh, for where it's decreasing, or for where it's increasing. <coughs> okay, so how about it? negative 5 to negative 2 and 1 to 4. <clears throat> Any question about, uh, about those? Okay. Now, <coughs> uh, 3. So on the plot, label all uh, local extrema. So remember, extrema is just a word that means uh, maxima or minima. So the extreme high and low points of the plot. So are there any uh, local minima? Yeah. How many? One. And what input produces it? One is the input that produces it, and, and negative two is the, is the, is the uh, local min output. So this point right here and that input right there, that's a local men. Are there any other local mens? Okay, how about any maxes? Are there any local maxes? So where are they? So the rain analogy works pretty well for mens. But are you also aware that, you know, like uh, if you fill a balloon with helium then they float, right? That's one of the neat things about childhood. Uh, Helium floats up also, so if you can imagine helium, where would, it, where would the helium get trapped? Where would the balloons get trapped? Right there. That's where they get trapped. Uh, so, <coughs> that point right there, that's a local max. Okay, good. Are there any other local extrema? Okay. Again, <coughs> on the plot, uh, label any global extrema. So, does this have any global mins? Global minima. What do you think? 
Yeah? Global min. At what input? Or inputs? Right. So look. The, the minimum possible output, output value is negative 2. Nothing lower than that occurs. But it occurs in two places. It occurs for input 1 and also for input negative 5. So the global min occurs in both places. They're both global min. So this is also uh, global min. And so is this one. So that's interesting. Uh, what about uh, global max? Is there one? And where is it? Same as the local max. So that's interesting. So uh, here's an example of a global min that is not local. Uh, here's uh, a, a global min that is also local. Here's a global max that is also uh, a local max. You could have something that's local but not global. What's this point over here? Nothing. It's not local. It couldn't lo be local anything. Why couldn't it be local anything? There's nothing on its right. There's nothing on its right. And it's not global anything. It's not a global max because that point's higher. It's not a global min because that point's lower. So it's not global anything either. So that point's just a nothing. Good. Any question about this? Okay. <coughs> then let's move to the next section. So we're in section, next section. What is it? Three, four. Uh, this is called something like combinations of functions. Okay. So the idea here is that in some ways functions behave like numbers. So let me explain what I mean. You can take two numbers and you can combine them to get another number. So for example, you take two numbers and add them and the result is another number. Or you could take two numbers and subtract them, the result is another number. Two numbers and multiply them, the result is another number. Uh, two numbers and divide them, and you can almost always get another number. Why do I have to say almost always? Because you can't divide by zero, so you could divide by anything that's not zero. And similarly, you could take two numbers and exponentiate one to the other, and you can do that so long as they're not both zero. Because zero to exponent four, that's easy. That's just, that's four, right? Uh, I guess you couldn't do zero to a negative number because that'd be a division by zero. But you also can't do zero to zero either because that's not defined. So you can combine numbers with the arithmetic operations and get new numbers. Human beings love this kind of system where you combine things of the same category and get, a, and get another thing of the same category. And it's weird when that doesn't happen. Uh, for example, human beings understand the system where you take two gats, cats, combine them, and you get more cats. It's, it'd be totally strange if you combined them and, and the result was not cats. OK. <clears throat> so for example, uh, uh, remark. Let f and g be functions. We'll define the sum function f plus g as. So remember, uh, the conceptual model that I want you to take for functions is they're like machines. They're like like machines that you put X's into and the, uh, or just generally w whatever kind of symbol you want and then the, what we're calling the output is F of X. So you put the X in and then out comes an F of X. And simil similarly, 
Uh, you could take the G machine, uh, put an X in, and then and then out comes a G of X. So functions are like little machines that you give that you give them inputs. <clears throat> so the F plus G machine is a bigger machine that contains these two machines. And what it does is you give it an X, it makes a copy of those X, it makes two copies, provides one to the F machine, provides another to the G machine, takes those two outputs, combines them by adding them together, And this is what we're calling f plus g evaluated at x. So now we're thinking of functions as machines. And now I want you to see that we can have, oh, machines within machines. OK. <laughs> yeah, machineception. <laughs> I like it. So uh, fine. So I could say. <clears throat> For example, well, before I even give an example, I'd like for you to observe that this would work. Uh, this all works equally well with, uh, we used plus, but we could have used subtract multiply or divide and it all would it would all look exactly the same except just replacing the plus with minus or multiply or divide <coughs> so uh, what I'm saying is that we have the following definitions is that f plus g evaluated at x that is to say you evaluate f you evaluate g and then you add the results and for subtraction, you evaluate F, you evaluate G, and you perform the subtraction. And for product, <coughs> you evaluate F, you evaluate G, and then multiply the results. And for those of you who have seen something, some things a little bit like this, I will remark here that um, that dot that I just wrote is a solid dot, which means multiplication. It is not an open dot, which means potentially something else. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, then don't worry about it yet. <coughs> so lastly, f divide g evaluate at x is well, evaluate f at x, evaluate g at x, and then perform the division. OK. So I could say, for example, if f of x is 3x plus 4, and if g of x is, um, say, x squared plus 9, then please evaluate f uh, divide g evaluated at, say, uh, 2. So what are we supposed to do? Mm -hmm. So we'll evaluate f at 2, we'll evaluate g at 2, and then perform the division. So what is f evaluated at 2? Ten. 10. And then what is g evaluated at 2? 5. <laughs> and then the answer is 2. Well, that's just a coincidence that the input was 2 and the output was 2. That's only a coincidence. <laughs> for, other, for other inputs, the output would not not be the same. Uh, fine. Now here's here's a question, and that is that um, 
you know, functions, one thing that we, we talked about last time or last week, I can't remember, uh, is that functions have a domain att attached to them. And we remarked that, for example, the function that is f of x is equal to 1 is not the same function as g of x is equal to x over x. They're not the same function. Why are they not the same function? Because their domains are different. So the question is, my question is, is the following. <coughs> Suppose that function little f has domain, which I'll denote by capital F, and that function function little g has domain big G. So that is to say that you're only allowed to give this function inputs coming from that set, and you're only allowed to give this function inputs which are coming from that set. My question is, is what is the domain of f plus g, of the sum function? Well, let's look at the diagram again. So if we have the f machine and we're going to supply it an x and it's going to produce for us an f of x. And if we have the g machine, we're going to supply it an x and it's going to produce for us a g of x. Then the f plus g machine is a machine that, that contains both of these machines. And what it does is it takes an input x and makes two copies of it and provides the first copy to f and the second copy to g. That's what the f plus g machine does. Uh, then it takes the outputs of those two and combines them with an add. And then the name that we give to that output is f plus g evaluated at x. OK, well, because of this little internal bit of the machine, because of that bit, where must x be because of this part of the machine? Because of this part, the input x has to be in that set. Right, because this part of the machine couldn't, could, couldn't possibly execute if x were out, outside of here. So as a result of this, x must be in this set. I hear the mic. Chirping. So because of, because of that bit of the machine, the input has to be in f's domain. OK, what else has to be also be true? Mm -hmm. Because of this part of the machine, this means that x has to be in g's domain. So the fact, so, so where does x need to be? In both. It's got to be in both. So that is to say, in a, in a Venn diagram, if you draw a Venn diagram, if this is set, if this is the permissible inputs for function f, and this is the permissible inputs for function g, then where are the permissible inputs for function f plus g? Right here. Sorry? Yeah, it's that one, <laughs> intersection. So the answer is that the domain of f plus g is 
domain of f intersect domain of g. Okay, wow. So now, there's nothing special about, particularly special about plus. Uh, if we replaced plus with minus, it would still be just as true. If we replaced plus with product, it would be just as true. Uh, but there'd be one additional restriction if we replaced plus with divide. Not only would it need to be an F's domain and also G's domain, but what else must be true? Yeah, that G can't be zero for that input. Okay, so let's have an exercise. So any question about this statement? So let's see how this gets tested in an exercise. So, for example, let f of x be 3x plus 4 on the interval, say, 2 to 18, and g of x be x squared plus 1 on the interval, say, uh, 7 to 39. So then I could ask, please find an expression and domain for the product function, f product g. So the expression part is the easy bit. It's, it's probably exactly what you think. And that is that the product function, f product g, evaluate at x is the product of these two expressions. So that'd be 3x plus 4 multiplied by x squared plus 1. Then you could FOIL this out and collect like terms, which I'll do very quickly because we're running out of time. So that'd be 3x cubed uh, plus 3x plus 4x squared plus 4. So that's, uh, that's the expression. Now what's the domain? How do we compute the domain? For example, is, say, 2 in the domain of the product function? No, it's not. Why is 2 not in the domain of the product function? Right. You could evaluate f, the f part at 2, and you could, but you couldn't evaluate the g part at 2. So you... So, so you that's, that couldn't be it. So the domain is the intersection of these two, 2 to 18, intersect 7 to 39. And I'll remind you of how to perform that computation next time. So have a nice uh, Wednesday.